podcast with my good friend, Larry Namer, founder mm -hmm. of E-Entertainment. Uh, so Larry, I'm just really excited to be here and talking about everything entertainment. I can't believe you convinced me to do this, <laughs> uh, but it, um, it should be fun. It should, you know, when I've guested with you, um, we've always had a good time, so I think this will be the same kind of thing. Pretty lighthearted look at uh, Hollywood and the fact that, you know, we're not uh, doing rocket science here. We're supposed to be entertaining people, so. Right, right. There's a lot going on, but the first thing I want to talk about is you know, I know a lot of the concerts and movie theaters are coming back, so I actually invited a guest today to talk about that, Dr. Mary Tahiri. She is uh, part of the COVID task team for Biden and Harris, and she's actually working on the forefront of the COVID vaccination and also the testing. So I figured I'll invite her and we could talk a little bit about you know, how things are opening again, right? I mean, now the, the concerts are coming back. Well, what, what are you hearing, Larry? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm hearing things are coming back. Actually, you know, I've been hearing, you know, Mary's name for quite a while. She's been in the forefront of this thing from almost the beginning, or if not the beginning. Um, so it'll be interesting to talk with her. Um, people in the concert world are beginning to talk that summer or slightly after summer, they'll be back. There's a lot of production getting ready to start up again now so things are getting back to normal I think particularly at the high end because when I look at the um, the COVID protocols for entertainment for production um, they're really really strict and prohibitive and I don't know how you know folks who kind of produce at the lower end or the middle um, survive those those extra costs and stuff so hopefully those those protocols will change and they'll lessen and um, you know, all, all ranges in the media world will start to be back up and running by the end of summer, I think. But that's kind of what I'm confused as far as, you know, larger venues. Now, I could see in smaller, more intimate venues, you know, you have people sitting six feet apart, but how are they going to do at the Staples Center or some of these larger venues? I mean... Well, I, I think you're still going to have, um, you know, some limited capacity. I don't think anybody's going to be at 100% capacity this year probably uh, I mean a good example I went to the Dodger game yesterday and um, you know it holds 50 some odd thousand people uh, but I think they've limited it to 20 or 25 percent and they did a great job they rope off the seats and stuff so that you really had no choice but to be you know socially distanced from your neighbors and stuff and it was really very comfortable and you felt very safe and stuff so I, I imagine that as we go along deeper and deeper into the baseball season they'll begin to open up more and more of that capacity but you know again I don't see this season ever being at a hundred percent yeah I mean so you did go to a game because I haven't been to one so they rope off like they have seats in between right as you're sitting or yeah that what they did I think they use like those tie things you know those plastic ties yeah, okay uh, so they made it so no matter what you did you couldn't use the seat certain seats so uh, we had four seats together and then in front of us uh, those seats were roped off on the sides of us those seats were roped off so you really were distance all the people who worked there were wearing masks um, they did not open all the food venues um, there, uh, just some of them, which to my chagrin, Shake Shack wasn't opened up when I was dying for a Shake Shack. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, everything uh, was non cash, you, so it had to be a credit card, you couldn't use cash. Yeah. And um, they were pretty good at enforcing the mask, the mask rules. If you were eating, you could take your mask off, but other than that, you had to wear the mask throughout the game. Wait, you said everything was cash? No, everything was card. Everything no was card, no cash. That's no that's cash what I thought. All. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's um, and what do you what do you see for the movie theaters? I mean, I know that they're planning on opening that soon, also. So, what are your thoughts? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, well, I I'm not as optimistic for the future of the movie theater business as uh, I am for some of the other things. And uh, you know, I I think just my behavior it would be like a Friday during the day and I go gee you know I, I'm finishing up early maybe I'll go to the movies later 
and um, I would just look in the you know in the guide and see what's playing. I say, okay, this looks like it's okay, and I'll go to the movies. I don't quite see myself going to just the movies anymore. I mean, if it's a big movie, if it's Star Wars or Masters of the Universe, yes, I want to see it in the theater. But you know, for all those smaller movies yeah. that I used to just go because I felt like going to the movies. I, I don't see myself doing that, and um, so I, I think that bodes well for the digital platforms. I mean, the Netflix and the Amazons and the Peacocks and everybody, I think, are loving it. Um, and I think people have become to realize that um, uh, not all the good stuff is in the movie theater. There's a lot of great stuff on television, so while it used to be this kind of snob appeal, it's like my movies are only in the theater. and. Yeah. You know, if you're a TV producer, you're a lesser human. Um, <laughs> that's that, that's kind of changed. That's not anymore. I mean, you look at the Netflix and the Amazons now. I mean, the quality level of what's out there is as good as anything in the theater, if not better. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, even the movie that <laughs> won Nomadland, you know, it's yeah. a movie that I saw on Hulu. I mean, it, it, it's not uh, something that I would have gone to a theater to watch it anyway. But... Uh, now we, we have a guest, uh, Johnny, I think uh, we're good to go with Dr. Mary Tahiri. She's on uh, the line. So let's ask her on some uh, questions about, uh, you know, the reopenings of concerts and entertainment and sure. film production. So we're excited to have her on. Hi, Dr. Tahiri, I have a question for you. You've kind of been at the forefront of this COVID thing in LA for since the very beginning for that matter. Um, so uh, where do you see things standing now, you know, as it affects the media and entertainment world? Are we gonna be back to concerts and back to producing anytime this year or do we still have a ways to go? That's an excellent uh, question, uh, Larry, and thank you for having me. Um, I would, my, First reaction and positive reaction is is yes, we see the concerts happening and um, things going back to somewhat of a normal this year. But in order for us to do that, we need to get to about 70 to 80% of our population having the vaccine on board, both, you know, the both dosages. Um, for Moderna and Pfizer, if they're gonna do choose that. So in order to get back to somewhat of a norm with the concerts and uh, large crowds, yeah, we have to have what it's called um, herd immunity. And that would be about 70 to 80% of our population needs to be vaccinated. And when do you think, and when, when do you, you estimate that? When do you happen? happen? You know, I, I was actually looking at the a time uh, in U.S., we've done an amazing job um, since uh, the new administration has taken uh, place. And, and I don't want to get political, but it has been a, a amazing effort to get this happening. And I'll tell you, we are about 40 percent or probably more than that now. Last week, we were at about 40 percent. So we're looking at probably another uh four to six months, maybe seven months to get to 70, 70 to 80%. But I also want to mention, if I may, um, Larry, is that the importance of vaccine is uh, there. It's repeated. The media is aware of it. The communities are aware of it. But let's not forget that because you're vaccinated, you're not able to contract the virus or pass it on to someone else. You can still do that. It's just that it's 100% effective against being hospitalized or dying or ending up on a, on a ventilator. Well, that, that's a good well, that, thing. That's a good thing. It is. So, <laughs> it's a very so, good thing. I, I look at, um, I look at the, the production the, requirements. I mean, we've got this huge document of, of COVID protocols and is it really is it really all necessary or is it just like somebody had nothing to do so they wrote 108 pages believe it or not i've read every single 
word of those pages because um, once I was done uh, being at the quarantine sites where I was the commander and running um, the sites, the COVID sites for Department of Health, Los Angeles County. And when I came back, I have to give the film industry credit they were really on it, on top of it, and very detailed, mind you. I was like, wow, they're more detailed than I, you know, public health department. Um, so uh, I think they did a phenomenal job in putting that together. Uh, they're, the team uh, consists of a couple of specialist um, physicians and um, uh, an attorney uh, that leads it that I know. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they worked really hard to put this together. Um, and I think that's why it's been successful and there hasn't been a major shutdown or spread amongst the film industry. But I also want to add testing, testing, testing is ex extremely important along with the vaccination and the masks and the social distancing. We need to continue with the testing and the frequent testing if we want to reopen successfully. Well, that's good. So you, you've been doing this literally from the very beginning that, that I remember. You were like one of the first ones that really dove in. Um, uh, but I, I, I actually know your husband. We go to the same barber. And um, <laughs> you, you've, got some, love... you've got some kids. How did you manage to balance just <sighs> what you were doing, you know, during the day versus going home to a family at night? How did that work? Wow, um, that is a really, really great question, Larry. And I, I want to give shout out to all the moms out there that have a career or work full time um, or multiple jobs. Um, it was not easy. I literally. Uh, was in a fight and flight mode type of mentality. And when I look back, um, there's a couple of video clips uh, amongst me and my staff, we, you know, uh, when we were on site and I look at myself and I think, oh my gosh, I look so stressed and, and tired, exhausted. But, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you just, you don't think about it. You just jump in and you do it. And you're absolutely right. I was uh, there since March when it started and uh, up till about September. And I have to say, um, Omar, my husband was amazing. He stepped up and he was a mom and a dad for, the kiddos. I was gone for pretty much 24 seven around the clock. Wow. So just in, in looking back, you know, as, as a doctor and, you know, a medical professional, if you were to kind of step back and be able to go back in time six months before today, like what would have been the major thing or things that you would have done different that, you know, you realize today, maybe you could have or should have been doing? Or, or um, not just you, or you know, us as a as a country. Yeah, I, oh boy, uh, there are so many things that I think about, um, Larry, and um, one of the main things that keeps on replaying in my head is the lack of testing. The lack of testing. Um, I was fortunate at my site that I didn't have issues with PPEs, you know, the masks and gowns and gloves and all of that. But uh, we could have definitely, as a nation, stepped up and done a better job. And um, unfortunately, it became more of a, it became politicized, right? It was more of a political thing rather than, uh, to me, I equate our pandemic to a World War Three. I really do, mm -hmm. and there, there are, there are so many lessons to be learned. Um, we need to be definitely prepared better. We need to, we cannot rely on others to sustain um, uh, when it comes to products, and that is a big lesson for us as a nation. Okay, and just. Looking at things today, I mean, we've made great progress. There's no question. And I think particularly in California, we've done amazingly well. I think we've gone from worst to first um, yeah. in, you know, the way we've dealt with this. But 
there has to be a way to be even better than we are. If you had ultimate power and we could change something today to make it better, faster, more efficient, well, what do you think that is? Oh, that is an, um, oh my goodness. Um, do we have 20 hours, to, <laughs> a couple of days to talk about this? Well, you know, uh, give, give us a simple version. You know, if okay. you had the magic wand and okay. you could change one thing today to make it even better than it's going. You know, to me, the health disparities actually came on surface. It came up and um, if we have a long ways to go to fix our broken healthcare system. And mind you, I'm not saying, and I don't want any other country uh, leadership to take this and say, oh yeah, we know, see, your healthcare providers are saying, um, experts are saying it's a broken system, you know? Uh, but we're open about it. You know, we talk about it because we know that the system is broken and we need to fix it. But compared to many other countries, we are a lot, a lot uh, better off than um, people may think. And then the other thing is, um, you know, the health disparities, the one thing that we could take from this horrible situation um, is that, and we don't wanna go back to the way we were. We don't want that as healthcare providers, as clinicians, as uh, humanitarians. We want it to stay where it's at as far as the, the issues that came on surface here. Uh, the, the black communities, the African-American communities, uh, the Latinos, the Native Americans, uh, but specifically, let's talk about our black communities and the healthcare system and what a disadvantage and, and we saw it even more clear during the pandemic and the unfortunate. So if I had a magic wand, I would make the, our healthcare um, more fair, um, more uh, read, readily available uh, to all. Got it. So um, Omar gets to talk to you a lot. That's why I've kind of been hogging. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've been hogging the conversation, but I'm going to let him ask you one or two questions. Go ahead, Omar. Well, earlier, Larry and I were talking about. Take it easy on me. Not so difficult <laughs> questions, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were, we were talking about, you know, going back to uh, per live performances and concerts, which has affected a lot of us artists. Uh, you know, one of the things that you know that i hear and everybody's talking about well are they going to test people you know how are they going to be able to are they going to check you know your vaccination cards and what would be the fastest way because i know when we go to these big events as as we've been together mm -hmm. you know they're hurrying people in you go through these metal detectors so are you seeing i mean what do you think the protocol is going to be for these larger events now larry and i were discussing it earlier I guess it's opening, you know, I think, what, back, in, like, starting August or September? Like, some of these big uh, A lot events. of people are talking about they're going to start opening the bigger venues, you know, late summer, uh, early fall. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, you know, limited capacity. Like I was telling Omar, I went to a Dodger game last night, and I think they oh. allowed 20% in and stuff. And they did a wonderful job of, like, roping off seats that you couldn't sit in. Yeah. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't maneuver them because they had them tied down. And you felt perfectly safe and stuff, yeah. and it was, it was just fun being back to something close to life as we used to know it. Um, yeah. So and I, and I could see the way they're gonna, you know, go from twenty percent, probably twenty five, and bring it up gradually and stuff. And it was just, it was great. It was Do really good. Do they check good. your card, your vaccination? Card? No, they didn't check your card, but they had a lot of rules. They didn't open all the food stands. For one, yeah. they open up some that they could control and make sure that everybody was following their protocols. Um, everybody at Dodger Stadium wore a mask. Um, yeah. I didn't see a single person without a mask. Even the players, um, when they would get up to bat, they would take their mask off. But even standing around a batter's box or in the dugout, they were wearing masks for the most part. And um, uh, you were no cash. You had to use credit cards. Um, nice. 
and, and stuff. And it was just done well, you know, it was well thought out and done well. And it was good because she got out and done well. And it was good because you could see the path back to normal. I so love, I, I love. For me, that's that. the confusing part is yeah. I read that people would have to present. I think it was a Lakers game or something where they were saying that they have to have their, you know, vaccination mm -hmm. cards or well, something. I mean, that's the, that's the part that I'm, I, is, did, did, so if you didn't, if you didn't have to do that, then there are people that were not vaccinated in there, right? Well, but, you know, think about this. I mean, my kids, you know, had their, uh, their drinking age driver's licenses when they were 15. I mean, I think if you have a system <laughs> where you're gonna do that, you're gonna find that you're gonna create this whole industry and in like yeah. fake vaccination <laughs> IDs and stuff. It's already exactly. happening. Uh, it's already happened. You know, the best way to do it is socially distance, make sure everybody follows protocols. Yeah. And then as we begin to get towards herd immunity, start to open yes. those numbers up a little bit and stuff until we get back to you know full capacity yeah i i love it and it sounds like the dodger stadium did a really great job um i do have to uh give my input here and the importance of testing is really really important for me i would definitely have regular testing um, there are uh, manufacturing companies here in the U.S. that are creating rapid testing that will take literally a few seconds, a few seconds. Wow. So um, for me, because uh, right now the ones that are FDA approved um, and it, it, it's trickled down from previous administration, they take anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. Well, you can't do that if you wanna yeah. you know, sell out arenas of 20, 30, 60,000 people. So to me, I think um, it is doable. I know companies that are out there working, Larry and Omar, these companies have worked tirelessly, tirelessly for the past year to create these devices that will allow a result within seconds. So um, I would definitely, if I was running Dodger Stadium or the Lakers, um, I mean, I, I had uh, the largest, my third site, COVID site, was the largest in the nation, if not globally, with 245 beds, with three over 300 clinical staff and logistics. And if I didn't have a spread, thank goodness, um, a major spread or a death it can it's possible we can do it we can reopen it's just we got to do testing you mm -hmm. know um and and like you said larry the importance of social distancing and continue to wear your mask even if you are vaccinated because remember the vac vaccination does not equate to eradication of the virus i want to say that again yeah. vaccination does not equate to eradication of the virus so yeah no even now i go out i'm super careful i wear my yeah. mask all the yeah. time i've had my two vaccines and stuff like that and then you know i i know people who've had it and had it really bad and um yeah. my partner for me he had it and uh ended up in icu for 12 days and on machines and all that stuff wow. and all i had to do he sent me a picture of him in the hospital and that was it for me i just said there's no way in the world i want to look like that um and i just you know limit the number of people who would come in and out of my house I, and i've opened it up a little but i've actually you know i do a lot of stuff in china and a friend sent me at this machine that when you you come in my house it's funny the machine takes your temperature and dispenses um you know hand sanitizer to you and if you temperature is not right it actually sends an alarm and i don't let you in oh that's great um you know what's so interesting to me is that um there are so many places and including uh the place that i ran the COVID site it's uh you know checking the temperature because that's the cdc requirement and protocols but it it's uh, the majority of the people uh, that I know, uh, my patients, th you know, clients or patients, thousands of them and staff, if they had, a lot of them didn't have a fever or, you know, temperature. So it was like, wait, let's not just go based off on that, you right. know, because yeah. you could be asymptomatic and be the carrier and passing it on 
along to others. So that's yeah. that's the scary no, the thing. Testing that's is the ultimate answer. There's no question. But I really, everything yeah. you could do in between from wearing the mask, getting the vaccine, washing taking your the temperature, washing your hands. Exactly. I mean, do it all. Exactly. Exactly. And we could we could have uh, we could have reopenings, uh, successful reopenings. I just fear, I really am scared and I fear that we're gonna, uh, I don't want us to fall into a greater hole. And uh, when we had our meeting, um, uh, you know, I'm the advisor to the Biden-Harris COVID task team. When last time we had our meeting over a month ago, it was, please, it has to come from the administration, it has come from Biden himself or his representative that, uh, again, uh, testing is ex extremely important and um, for reopening and as well as to pass the message on, uh, don't throw your masks away because you're vaccinated. Yeah, <laughs> well, we know you're busy and we're gonna let you go in a second, but if you had to pick one mm -hmm. good thing that's come out of this whole mess, what, what would you say? What, what, there's something positive here. What, what do we draw from this? Oh, I, I love this because uh, I want to say, I'm, I'm going to say two things, <laughs> if I may. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, the one thing that I had mentioned earlier is the health disparities being on the surface and us actually doing something about it and, and helping our brothers and sisters and the uh, you know, African American communities and the minority communities. That to me is phenomenal. I am so grateful that that positive aspect has come out. Number two, I have to say that this brought family members closer together as we uh, most, I mean, I worked outside um, on the front lines, but the majority were forced to spend more time with their children and, uh, and spouses and get to learn more about each other and spend that quality time. No, that's great. That's great. So we're going to let you go to work, save some more lives, um, take Thank care you. of those kids, and once in a while feed the hubby. He looks, <laughs> he's looking a little frail. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. It was good to see you, Larry. Right. Take Omar. care. Bye bye. I love you. Bye bye. Very, very interesting conversation with Dr. Mary Tahiri. I learned so much and there's, you know, I think we're making progress every day, right, Larry? I mean, it's going to be a while. I mean, when do you foresee like everything going back to what it used to be or that you don't think it's ever going to happen? Well, I, I don't really see things going back to what used to be. I, I mean, let's look at the movie business and, you know, the big studios are going to still do the blockbusters. And yeah. quite honestly, I will go to the movies to see those yeah. blockbusters. But you know, then that next level down movies, everybody's now begun to realize you can get those on you know Amazon and Netflix or whatever. So really, what are the implications of that? So you've got the AMCs and all these 16 screen theaters that really are no longer gonna have a need for 16 screens. So the, the movie theater business is going to change. They're gonna have to find out other uses of, of using those properties. And you know, if I if you own a uh, you know a mall, if you're a commercial property developer, you know it used to be you'd have a Macy's at one end of the mall and an AMC theater at the other. Well, those days are gone. And you know, as a parent, um, and you've got young kids. I mean, are yeah. you letting your kids go and hang out at the mall on weekends ever again, no. <laughs> or at least in you know the near future? So the the whole nature of what a mall is and you know, how it fit into our social schemes, that's gonna change unbelievably. And I don't really ever see it coming back to the way it was. It'll get back a little bit towards there. Um, but you know, movie makers, you know, where the ego is telling you that, you know, if you're a real movie maker, you're only in the movie theaters, um, that's changed. People who make movies now realize that they could write and produce incredible stuff for the digital platforms and stuff. and People have realized that they could watch it at home. And, you know, as, as Mary was saying, you know, this value of family, um, it's wonderful to be able to sit home with your family and watch something on TV because that's the way I grew up. And then that changed entirely yeah. where you never would see your kids or whatever, but now you're watching TV together, which, you know, to me, that's a real plus.
So that's how you see the future <laughs> unfolding more and more? Yeah, I think malls will become more lifestyle centers. I think you'll see some of them will be converted to mixed use where you could live there, work there, eat there, uh, do all of that. They, you know, that's still to be seen how that changes. Um, the enter movie and entertainment business is that whole middle of it is going to move um, to doing stuff, you know, for the digital platforms as opposed to just the movie theaters. Uh, and again, there's still going to be theaters and there'll still be times you want to go, but it's not going to be like before. Um, I see the music business eventually getting back there. It'll take some time, but, you know, what uh, parent of a 16-year-old is letting their kid go and lay in the desert with 100,000 other kids at Coachella? Um, that's not happening for a while. Uh, it's going to take a, a long while before we forget how bad this thing really got. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think in, in, in the digital, the home theater systems are getting better and better. I mean, you could set up a really nice theater system in your house for pretty reasonable price, oh, right? I mean, God, yeah. with the, the, the speakers and you know, I mean, the big screen TV, I mean, you got a beautiful big screen TV at home. I mean, that's the kind of thing. And the prices is unbelievable for under a thousand dollars. You can get like an 80 inch huge television set. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you could do that. And then, you know, you look at, <coughs> you know, some of the other things that have happened and, you know, particularly in the music business, um, the whole idea of streaming. I, I don't mean streaming from your living room, you know, that. That was kind of cute and interesting when it started. But, you know, I, I'm looking at now doing a, um, a streaming project where using a COVID safe facility built that's built in LA, where the band could come in and stay socially distanced, no audience, but we figured out how to pump an audience sound. We turn up the lights like on Broadway, so the band can't tell that there's really not people okay. in the audience and they hear the sound. So yeah. it's as close to that concert feeling as they'll ever get, which they need to really get them going, you know, in terms of performance level. And, um, you know, we're taking countries that, um, you know, we specialize, we do a lot of stuff in China. And um, it's um, it's really, you know, working, you know, a big star. Ariana Grande would come and play Shanghai and Beijing. But there are 34 other cities in China of over 10 million people that never seen an Ariana Grande live. Yeah. So this is going to open up that opportunity. Uh, you know, the other thing that I'm working on and been working for the last, you know, half year now is a new concept called FanVesta, where fans and celebrities are able to get together in a much more int intimate relationship, and the fans could actually invest in the businesses of their favorite celebrities. And, you know, a year and a half ago, if I would talk to a manager about a rock star doing, you know, something different, they would go, ah, oh, you know, we're touring and Coachella's good and we don't really need to do that. Yeah. We'll tour and we'll sell merch and we're fine. Everybody now is looking at saying we need to have diversity of our revenue streams. So we can't just depend on touring all the time or, or merchandise all the time. So a lot of people in sports world and TV, film world, music world, art, fashion, um, they're all looking at these alternative ways of making money. So FanVestor, you know, has really uh, been in a great spot because it's really a, a, it's a platform that's dedicated to putting fans together, you know, with their favorite celebrities in whether it be securities or e-commerce or even charity fundraising. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been great. I mean, you, you guys have been really doing an incredible job and putting the fans together with the celebrities. Now, I know, who was the last celebrity? I know you, you like a few people that you guys worked with. Was it uh, a basketball player, Amari, I think? That you yeah, we, we're doing the thing with Amari Stoudemire. So here's a case where, you know, famous basketball player, he now coaches for the Brooklyn Nets. Um, he is totally into health and wellness, and he started a wellness line of supplements and things like that. So he, you know, while he was able to finance the company by himself, he didn't need the fans to finance the company. He wanted to create this relationship with his fans where he would offer the product first to them for only three months, four months, five months, and make it almost collectibles. So that if you buy the product, if you're a fan, you go to the FanVestor site, you buy the product, and you get an autographed picture. And if you order, you know, 
a month a month supply or an annual supply, uh, you get a you know a T-shirt or a hoodie or something like that. So the the more you buy, the more the perk or the collectible is worth uh, to you. So you know dealing with a uh, a Mario basketball player uh, doing something now a, a project with um, a guy that's a stylist for a TV show called Black Ink. Uh, his name is Quentin, and um, Quentin came up with this thing of. Uh, uh, hair dyes, both permanent and temporary hair dyes, where if I had it, um, <laughs> I would be able to go out tonight with purple hair, but you know, or and I could change tomorrow to yellow or pink or yeah. whatever I wanted to do. So he's now again offering product to his fans with these perks and experiences that go with it. So he's really he's making something good for the fans so they feel special, but he's also getting to know his fans on a much more intimate level so that his connection to those fans could be a lot deeper than it was before, where they were basically anonymous to him. Yeah, that's a really great idea. And that's, so you're doing that on a, it's for a larger scale. Now he has a f big following because he had a TV show, right? Uh, yeah, he still has a TV show. He Black Ink is still on, yeah. Okay, yeah. But so you, you, could act, you don't need to necessarily have the entire, um, you know, social media following yourself. It could be people in your sphere, uh, people that um, are interested in the same concepts that you are. Uh, so you could aggregate social media fan bases and stuff and put them together. And, and the real key is the ability to use social media to bring down the marketing cost of these campaigns yeah. so that they become affordable to a lot more uh, types of different businesses or types of operations. I want to switch a little bit here and talk about our next guest that we have on. Uh, Mr. D. Mr. D. I'll tell you a little story about Mr. D before yeah. we bring him on. Okay. I, only one time in my entire history of being in LA have I ever been, uh, been denied access to a restaurant. Um, <laughs> we, I got called by Mr. D, come and meet me, we're going to Mastro's, I'll buy you a steak. Great. I go there. And there's Mr. D wearing God knows what. I can't even, you know, <laughs> Gucci pants and Prada shirt and some other sandals. And he had his hair dyed well, pink. He's very stylish. And um, for the first time ever, we were denied access into a restaurant. It's, uh, but anyway, other than that, um, just a little background on Mr. D. He's doing a new thing now called Beauty Queen. And Beauty Queen is really, really interesting. It's kind of a... A uh, hybrid. It's a social media platform. It's a uh, a commerce platform. It's a content platform, but it's really geared to service the needs of you know the LBGQ community and you know particularly young kids who have kind of their parents don't understand them, their friends don't understand them, and they're really struggling with identity issues and stuff like that. So what we try to do is create almost this Mickey Mouse Club thing, a safe place where they can go home and no, they, they could be with other kids that are like them um, and be able to be open and honest and talk about their feelings and what they think and stuff like that without, you know, having to worry about being vilified or anything. So Darren is doing that. I, Mr. D Mr. is D. doing that. And, uh, but before that, he was the uh, branding uh, guy behind such brands as Ed Hardy, uh, oh, which wow. when you think about that, you know, how do you take a... Um, what I call an ugly skull, and turn it into a billion dollar brand. He figured out how to do that. And then more recently, he worked with Francois Nars and they did Nars Cosmetics together and that was sold to a Japanese company for a few billion dollars and stuff like that. So he really knows how to tune into that, you know, the pop culture markets and, uh, you know, create products and, uh, and experiences that they're real interested in, you know, being part of. Well, I'm, I'm a fan of his. I think he's done some, you know, great work, and I can't wait to actually talk with them. So let's go and see if we can find him. Everything Hollywood will be right back after this break. Start it up. Well, 
there we are with the fabulous Mr. D. Mr. D, it's Omar. Welcome to the show. Yes, I am so happy to be here. So blessed today being here with the mogul and the musician. I'm thrilled to be here on FanBester. Thank you so much for having me. Well, here's, here's um, uh, a person that I already told the story about how I was refused an entry into a restaurant in L.A. for the first time because I was with you. Um, but even beyond that, uh, you're doing this thing, Beauty Queen, now. So tell us what Beauty Queen's all about. Look, Larry, we have a long-time relationship. You're one of my greatest mentors ever. And we've talked so many times, and I've talked so many times about how there's these kids out there that have these dreams that aren't exactly like everybody else's dreams. They want to dream of glitter and glamour and glitz. And growing up, I was exactly like that as a kid. So we set out to create something truly amazing and magical for kids, for teens, tweens, and queens, who, like me, when I was growing up, after school, I spent time at Barney's and Bloomingdale's instead of being on the basketball court or the baseball field. And whether these kids consider themselves boys, or girls, or gender fluid, or gender neutral, or gender free, whatever you might describe yourself as, you're gonna find a home here on Beauty Queen. And the bond between our community on Beauty Queen is makeup. All these kids have a fascination and have a passion for makeup. It's today's comic books. And we're so excited to bring this product to market very soon. Wait, wait, you, you keep saying we are so excited. Who's the we, who's, who's on this with you? So it's an amazing team. One of my BFS forever, the one and only iconic fashion style legend from New York, Richie Rich. Richie is such a dynamic, talented individual. He has a museum on permanent exhibition in the Met, and he designs fashion that makes people say, OMG, who made that? That's Richie Rich. Richie, when I met him years ago, we were kids backstage of Fashion Week in New York. And then I flew to Los Angeles to a fashion show. He was backstage again. I finally went over and introduced myself. And we hit it off. We, came, we became fast friends. We were so different, yet so the same. He did everything that I always wanted to do. And I did everything he wanted to do. And so we tried for many years to come together. And the timing, as they say, the sun, the moon, and the stars aligned. And boom, we decided to get together on Beauty Queen. And then we have some other fabulous people We've done a casting, not just here in America, but throughout the globe, for really fascinating, young, talented personalities that once again want to change the world with a makeup brush. Yeah, Can't that, wait. That's, so wait, so this is the same Richie Rich. When I was uh, in New York in the 90s, I could never get into a nightclub because I wasn't, quote, a club kid. Is this Richie Rich from the club kids? Absolutely. Richie Rich is the original club kid, in fact, Larry. And he paved the trail, he set the trends, he was on every talk show back in those days, whether it be Geraldo, Joan Rivers, your network e-entertainment television, really to think differently and independently as an American designer. He was one of the first designers of modern times that I saw that marched normal people down the runway and not just supermodels. And then he combined Naomi Campbell and Pamela Anderson and it was a frenzy to get into anything that he was involved in, whether it be tickets to one of his fashion shows or behind the velvet rope to one of his club parties. That's the same Richie Rich, absolutely. Wow. Mr. So, D, I'm sorry. Can I can yeah, I, go, just, go ahead. I just want to jump in real quick? I just want to say it's so nice to be talking to you. And, you know, you seem so passionate. You're very well spoken. But did you always have this passion? I mean, I'm, I'm detecting that you're a real passionate about your art and and everything that you're doing how young were you when you started i know you talked about when you were in school but you've always been passionate and an artist from an early age yes i always was i was a young model a young actor growing up in new york and that evolved into watching the behind the scenes and truly being fascinated what went on behind the scenes um, I've watched so many videos of yours, the making of your music, showing the recording studio, how you lay down the tracks. I love that. I love the energy, the passion, the 
creativity and of course like you said the artistry that goes into putting together a production and as a young kid in new york i would sneak into different events and then finally had the opportunity to be a part of new york fashion week and that really set things in motion for me in overdrive and then it was off we go into a wonderful world of fashion beauty and glamour so so be beauty queen just so i'm clear it's spelled with a K, right? So it's not Q, but it's K W E E N, right? Correct. And Beauty Queen with a, with a K, absolutely. And when, when is it going to be live? We're going live this summer, summer 2021, and we can't wait. We've already started doing some amazing, amazing conversations with kids throughout the globe who are passionately waiting with passion to get in and get their ticket into Beauty Queen. You know, people say to me all the time, guys, what's it like creating brands? And I say, you know, I don't create brands. I create worlds. I was always fascinated with Walt Disney because he created an amusement park. I like to say that the brand is the amusement park. The product is the souvenir. And in my case, brands sometimes of lately can become very boring because they're created in boardrooms. So we want to create a world that truly is exciting and hyper and over the top and awesome. So when... I, when I go on to beauty, what, beautyqueen.com, uh, starting this summer, what, what am I going to see? What's a typical day going to look like? Beauty Queen, Larry, will be the place that you'll want to live as a makeup super fan. I know that you definitely are one of the biggest makeup super fans out there on the planet. So you want to hang out there the way you probably used to hang out on ESPN on the app. You want to come to Beauty Queen from morning to moonlight and check in and meet other people that are like-minded, that have the same fascination with makeup, learn how to do makeup, see our special guests. We have a slate of celebrities that are gonna be talking about makeup and not just makeup, what affects them every day? What makes them artists like you're asking me? What makes them love purple instead of pink? Why they have their car wrapped in uh, glitter and pink instead of black? This is the things that we want to tell everyone about and we want to share with the world. And we have such a diverse group that's on this because that's how I've always grown up. That's how I've seen things, and especially Richie as well. Richie is one of the only designers I know that from a young designer was always wearing a full face of makeup. He was never scared. He was never fearful. He always wanted to do that. And as we've done this casting product, um, as we've done this casting, guys, we've spoken to so many really truly gifted makeup artists that are 19 20 years old and they tell us they can't even walk outside their front door without fear of getting beat up in places like louisiana kansas florida in this day and age in the year 2021 that this still exists look we might not be able to change the world but we sure hope to paint the world in fabulous fabulous color yeah that's, that's amazing and you know i i know you and i know you're um, fashion experience goes back, you know, even before, but uh, New York Fashion Week, and you've always been involved in that world. Now, here, I'm going to put you on the spot a little. So, look at Omar, okay? okay. He's kind of got his Steve Jobs look going. How do we, what, what would you do to change Omar's look to make him more Lady Gaga? <laughs> That's exactly what we try to say to everyone and the purpose. Look, if you don't beat to everyone else's drum, but beat to your own, that's what it's about. It's about being me. So I think Omar is great doing Omar. He walks out and he has something that not every other gentleman that walks to a restaurant has. He can play every instrument with his eyes closed. He can write a score, lickety split. That type of character is one of a kind. So I think Omar is great being Omar, a big smile, a great tune, and you have us at hello, Omar. Wow. I was hoping for like <laughs> something with like painting his head yellow or something, but okay, we'll take that. Thank, so, thank you, Mr. Anyway, D. Anyway, Mr. D, thank you for joining us. I think for the next time, we're gonna want you and Richie Rich on, and basically you guys could do a makeover on Omar and I. Absolutely. Richie Rich says hello. He's traveling today across country at an evening flight. We're in New York right now working on a project with things starting to open up during this horrible time in the world. 
we look at it as you know a way to ride our rainbow to beauty queen and have some fun in a time that maybe is a little bit more somber so we aim to bring fun to fanvester we love everything you guys are doing we're tracking all the amazing exciting launches you guys have had and we wish everyone the most success the most happiness the most health and keep dreaming that's what it's all about guys you gotta keep dreaming don't ever ever stop dreaming all right well we we know that you've got a new brand to launch and you're pretty busy we just want to thank you for spending this time with us and you know let's get you and richie on together and let's really start to explore some new stuff that you guys are doing thank you so much yeah thank you Mr. absolutely D. thank you very much thank you omar thank you larry thank you everyone at fanvester see you all in beauty queen soon bye wow that was uh i'm, I'm glad you you put me on the spot with uh you know giving me a makeover oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know look it, it, there's a thing with the black turtle link you know that's that's the latest it's, thing that's what yeah it's hollywood if you're not wearing black you don't belong there so i mean black with no hair is kind of the thing so you know you and i are doing okay we're, we're doing fine i think we'll be fine and i'm sure mr d can contribute quite a bit yeah to make us look you know uh, yeah, that he can. Between him and Richie, you just cannot believe some of the things that uh, happen when you're around those two guys. But anyway, you know, this has been, you know, an interesting first show for us. Yeah. And um, I, I would really love to hear from people who watch this show, like, what are the subjects they want to hear us cover? I mean, between you and I, we've got a hundred years in the media and <laughs> entertainment business. Not quite, but close. Yeah. Um, so we've kind of been through it all. Um, we know most of the aspects. I'd really love to hear from the audience. What is it? What is it they want us to be able to bring to them in the next shows? Yeah, and then on the next show we'll uh, discuss some of the projects you and I are developing at yeah. the moment. You know, some some really cool stuff happening. So yeah, we'll bring in some interesting some of our friends to come on. And you know, I've been spending a little more time lately <laughs> on Clubhouse, so I've been uh, meeting some <laughs> interesting people. Um, I want to, uh, you know, I might invite my friend Tony K, you, you, uh, the film director. Oh, sure, yeah. You know, um, he's, he's an interesting guy. He does music, but he's doing also, I'm, I'm seeing him this week, but we reconnected on uh, Clubhouse. So uh, Clubhouse is kind of giving me an opportunity to reconnect with some people that I haven't talked to for a while. Great. Yeah, and maybe you could find out from... <clears throat> those people on Clubhouse, what is it, what are the things they want to hear us talk about, and what guests do they want us to have on? I'll I'll definitely I'll definitely put it out there to people, and they could some of them might call in. So it's good that we're able to do that here, if people are calling in. So yeah, great great first show, Larry. I hope that uh, oh. you know we'll continue doing it. Yeah, we'll, well we'll be doing this uh, every week. Yeah. Um, so there'll be a new show up there every week on the Fan Vesta Podcast Network. Um, I think we follow, they are, oh, they already started the Fan Vesta Report with Jeslyn Moe, and we'll be show number two on there. And, um, you know, very quickly, people are going to love us, and we're going to be show number one. <laughs> and, of course, I'll put it on my YouTube channel as well for people to check it out and for all our social media, so it should be a lot of fun. So thank you, Larry, for wanting to do a show with me. That's amazing. Hey. I, I like your wife. <laughs> That's what it is. All right. So well, thank you. And thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys next week. Okay. Bye now. Are you craving the latest of La La Land? Tune in to Everything Hollywood featuring Larry Namer and Omar Akram.